Lesson 45. Hello again. You may recall in Lesson 11 on Capturing Motion that there are basically two ways of expressing movement in an image, by either blurring or freezing objects that are in motion. In this lesson, we're going to further our study of photographing motion by focusing on two exciting techniques, panning and zooming during exposure. I can tell you right now that both methods are pretty challenging, but they can yield some really awesome results with practice. We'll begin with panning. Panning is a technique that involves the camera following a subject in motion, such as a car or a jogger, as the subject moves laterally in the distance. If you can imagine taking aim at a moving target with a high-powered rifle and firing at just the right moment, you've got a pretty good idea of what panning is all about. The idea is to freeze the subject while at the same time blurring the background when you trip the shutter, resulting in a unique image that is all blurry except for the main subject. In order to succeed in this technique, it's essential to stabilize the camera by means of supporting it on a tripod in order to both follow the object smoothly and allow for a crisp image of the object in motion when the shutter is fired. A slow shutter speed will record the resulting motion of the background due to the camera movement as a blur. In a nutshell, it's all about timing. For these shots, I went to a nearby park on a sunny autumn day and attached my Nikon D3100 with an 18 to 70 millimeter lens to my tilt-all tripod. It's important to use a tripod that allows the panning motion of the camera. Some video tripods will not allow for this movement. I chose a vantage point where I could include both the passing vehicles and a decent amount of foreground and background in the frame while my lens was zoomed to its maximum focal distance of 70 millimeters. I was careful to avoid obstructions in the foreground, in this case the trees lining the park. I loosened my tripod height adjustment set screw so I was able to pan the camera smoothly from left to right or right to left. Before actually shooting, I practiced the path of my camera as I followed passing cars going both directions, so all I'd have to do is pick a car and start shooting. Next, I put my mode dial on shutter priority since shutter speed would be critical to success. I knew that something under a sixtieth of a second would be a good place to start, and I wanted as shallow depth of field as I could get in order to enhance the blurred effect of the background in motion. For this reason, I chose the lowest ISO available for my camera, which was 100. When I began shooting, I chose a thirtieth of a second, which gave me a relatively large aperture for shallow depth of field, but the overall effect was disappointing. I continued slowing the shutter speed down by a stop until I finally decided on one tenth of a second at around f22, which gave me the best overall effect with this particular lens. A special note, using a longer lens would increase the blurred effect of the background, but I purposely wanted to use a lens with a focal distance that most people have access to. A couple of things to keep in mind while panning your shots is to continue following the object even after you've tripped the shutter. If you choke and don't follow through with the panning action, your background will not blur sufficiently. Another tip is to set your shutter release mode to continuous so you can capture several frames in a single panning sweep. I had taken this shot of a motorcyclist before I had a chance to attach my camera to a tripod, and you can see the difference having a tripod makes. Everything in this shot is blurry. It's an okay shot, but having a crisp image of the object in motion is much more effective, I think. After I'd taken several shots, I started experimenting with composition. I tilted the angle of the camera so the vehicles would appear to be traveling either uphill or downhill. This made for a more interesting shot. Panning, of course, can be done with anything in motion, as long as it's moving from side to side in the viewfinder. And if you have a longer lens, as I mentioned before, your choices will be more numerous and the effect can be even more dramatic. The other technique for capturing motion I want to show you must be carried out with a zoom lens. The idea here is to zoom the lens either in or out during exposure of a scene, resulting in an image that looks something like this, with diagonal lines caused by the movement of the lens elements during exposure, converging from the edges of the frame toward the center. The results can be either totally abstract, such as this shot I took of trees in the forest, 
and this creek bed are well defined like this fire hydrant and this bridge with repeated shafts of sunlight. So how do you go about executing this technique? Well, the first thing you need to do is to mount your camera to a good sturdy tripod and set the mode dial to shutter priority since that's the most critical factor in this technique. Next, compose a scene that has a lot of contrast, preferably with a centrally located subject that contrasts from the rest of the scene, such as this bright, colorful fire hydrant. How close or far away you stand from the subject will affect the final look of the shot, as you'll soon discover. Tighten all the fittings on your tripod once you've carefully composed your scene in the viewfinder. Select a fairly long shutter speed that will allow you enough time to fully zoom your lens, either in or out, while the shutter is open, such as one-eighth of a second. Since your camera's meter will choose your aperture automatically, take note of what the f-stop will be, since it will have an effect on the overall shot to some degree. Now go ahead and either fully zoom in or out on the subject. Which way you choose to begin makes no difference, since you'll be trying the shot both ways. Next. Depress the shutter release button and simultaneously zoom the lens all the way in or out before exposure is complete. This will of course take practice. The wonderful thing about digital cameras is that you can immediately review your shots afterwards, which really helps in this case. Once you've succeeded in taking a shot, decide if you need to do anything to tweak it with regard to composition, exposure, and so on. Then shoot again, this time doing the reverse of what you did before. Continue shooting, tweaking as needed, and working on your timing. The shots will almost always be different every time, and some shots will be better than others. Another thing to try is a faster shutter speed, such as 1 15th of a second. This may seem like it's too fast for a full zooming cycle, but it's doable with practice. And the funny thing is that it will have quite a different effect on how your shots look. Once you're happy with a series of shots, move on to another subject. You'll find that this technique is quite addicting once you get going, and after a while, you'll have all kinds of shots to pour over. Well, that's about it for this lesson. I hope you'll give panning and zooming a try sometime. In fact, I think it's about time for another photo contest. Post your best shots of panning and or zooming on the Photography 101 Facebook page, and the best shot will earn the winner a valuable prize to be announced later on. Good luck, everybody. Until next time, goodbye. Mm -hmm.